In this video we give five examples of how graph colouring can be used to solve real world problems. Further information on these and other examples can be found in this book here, A Guide to Graph Colouring Algorithms and Applications. Let's just remind ourselves what we're seeking to achieve in the graph colouring problem. We're given a graph like this which is simple and undirected and we're looking to assign colours to the vertices of the graph so that the minimum number of colours is used and so that no adjacent vertices are allocated the same colour. So here you can see a solution to this problem. This is actually an optimal solution. It's using five colours and as you can see vertices with the same colours uh, are always non-adjacent. So one of the original problems for graph colouring, where it first originated, was um, with the colouring of maps. Now this was first pointed out in the 1800s that uh, a map could be coloured uh, using only four colours so that neighbouring regions always had different colours. So where does this relate to uh, vertex colouring? Well here we can see a map of Wales here and England bordering on the right. Now what we do is in each region of this map we place a vertex. It can be anywhere within this region but we just make sure there's one in every region and then we draw edges between any neighbouring regions. So you can see here for example that this region here uh, neighbours the sea on the left and all of these around here and as a result uh, this vertex is adjacent to all of those. If we now take the map away we're left with what is known as a planar graph and what we're seeking to show here is that a planar graph can be four coloured and if that's always true then maps can always be four coloured as well. So here we've produced a four colouring to this using some algorithm and as a result we can then map those colours back to the original map. So you can see the black vertices now correspond to black regions in the map and so on. Uh, the four colouring theorem, as this became known as, uh, was one of the most famous problems in all of mathematics for about 150 years and it was eventually solved in the 1970s. Graph colouring can also be used to help solve Sudoku puzzles. So a Sudoku puzzle is a grid like this where we're given some numbers and our task is to fill in the remaining blank cells so that each row, each column and each 3x3 three three box contains the numbers 1 through to 9 exactly once. So this shaded cell here for example we can deduce it to 6 by looking at the contents of uh, the corresponding boxes, rows and columns. Let's consider a smaller example. This is a four by four grid. What we do is we just label the, the cells, 1 through to 16 in this case, and each of these cells corresponds to a vertex uh, in, in our graph. Uh, then what we need to do is we need to add edges to this graph. So you can see for example that vertex 1 has an edge between 2, 3 and 4 because 2, 3 and 4 are on the same row. It has an edge between uh, 5, 9 and 13 because 5, 9 and 13 are in the same column and it also has an edge between uh, 5 and 6 because 5 and 6 are also in the same box. So once we add those edges for all vertices we can see a, 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 a colouring for that, a four colouring of that corresponds to a, a Sudoku solution. So uh, ones here correspond to reds, blues to twos, yellows to threes and blacks to fours. Of course, as we saw, usually in Sudoku problems, um, some of the cells are already filled in for you, and those are the clues that are supposed to help you to fill out the rest of the grid. So what that uh, corresponds to in a graph colouring problem is some of the vertices already being coloured for you, and you just having to colour the rest. Our third example involves the, the designing of seating plans for large social gatherings such as weddings, gala dinners, charity fundraisers and so on. Imagine we are giving a list of guests to our gathering um, and guests belonging to the same family, couples and so on, are placed into the same row. So Kath, Michael, Kurt and Rosie are a family, Pat and Susan are a couple and so on. So they should be sat together. However, let's also imagine that some of these uh, guest groups don't get on with one another. So Pat, for example, doesn't get on with John, Una, for example, doesn't get on with Bill and so on. So we would like those people to be sat at different tables if possible. Now how many tables do we need to make sure all of those um, constraints are met? Well this can be modelled as a graph as such. We just have a vertex for each uh, guest group 
and then we have edges between guest groups that are known not to get on with one another. We then color the group, we then color the graph, and as you can see, we can color this using just two colors. So we can place all of the guests onto just two tables while making sure that no pairs of guest groups that dislike each other are on the same table. Of course, we can use more tables than this if we want, but this would be the minimum in this case. In reality, we have other constraints such as we might want certain couples and families to be together, or we might prefer families to be apart but it might not be a strict requirement and such uh, constraints are taken into account by this tool here WeddingSeatPlanner.com which you can uh, try out for yourself. Graph colouring can also be used to schedule tasks that occur over time. Let's think about this in terms of scheduling some taxi journeys. In this figure here we have a series of taxi journeys with a start time and an end time. So imagine these uh, 10 journeys have already been booked in advance. So this is this the, the, the left of the line denotes when they will be leaving the taxi rank and the right of the line denotes when they will be returning. And obviously a taxi cannot embark on another journey until it has returned from a previous journey. So here we have a series of bookings. Now each of these bookings can be, uh, be represented as a, uh, as a vertex and then edges occur between any pair of vertices that are overlapping in time. So for example, 1 overlaps in time with 2, 3 and 4 but not anything after that. So 5, 6, 7 onwards it doesn't overlap with. And as you can see uh, in the corresponding graph, vertex 1 um, is adjacent to vertex 2, to vertex 3, and to vertex 4. Now what we can do here is, once we've colored this graph, uh, the red um, vertices will correspond to the first taxi, the yellow to the second taxi, and the blue to the third taxi. And as you can see, we've managed to schedule all these journeys using three taxis. So a minimum number of colors corresponds to a minimum number of taxis. In fact, this type of graph is known as an interval graph. So this is a special type of topology, and it's known that these can always be solved optimally. In fact, all we need to do is order the um, vert order the vertices in terms of their starting times as we've done here uh, and then just apply the greedy algorithm using vertex 1 then 2 then 3 and so on and we will always get an optimal solution and a proof for that can be found in, in the book I referenced earlier. Our final example concerns lecturing lessons lectures and so on at educational institutions Let's uh, imagine we're at a university and we wish to schedule some lectures. So we have nine lectures here, algebra, probability theory, graph theory, French literature and so on. Now as we can see some of these lectures clash with one another. So for example algebra cannot be timetabled at the same time as probability theory because there's a two here, uh, perhaps because there's some student that wishes to take them both. So with these clashes, we can then define this as a graph again, like we have here. So this is actually what we call an adjacency list, uh, and this is its graphical representation. Now we can color this, and once we've done that, uh, each color will correspond to a time slot. So you can see now that we've, we're able to schedule algebra, English literature, and Welsh literature at the same time, because none of them clash, so no student will be required to be in more than one place at a time. U usually in timetabling, we're also concerned with meeting other constraints. Uh, what we usually call secondary constraints. So we might want to stop students from having to sit too many lectures in a row, we might want students to be able to have a lunch break and so on. So we might be wanting to satisfy other constraints, not just those expressed within this graph colouring model. One way of doing this is to design operators that allow us to move through the space of feasible colorings in order to optimize secondary objective functions. Further details on this and other examples of how graph coloring can be used in the real world can be found in this book.